Everybody, we are back. It's Icy Walker here, and we are Karen was on for exactly where we were. Um, hopefully, I can read it a lot better now. I don't know what was happening earlier. I just had trouble reading some of the text, but uh, hopefully, it should be okay now. So, we're doing the, from the final element, which is shadows. In a 3D platform game, the shadow plays a key role in turn loss, where the player, where, where the character will land if he jumps or falls. This means that should have a good, um, good visible shadow, which is not the case at the moment. Shadows can be produced using lights, with the shadow computed and rendered in real time by the graphics engine. However, shadows are expensive in terms of processing power. In addition, not all graphics cards can compute shadows quickly or effectively. All the cards may not be able to do so at all. For this reason, we should use blob shadow for blob shadow for depths. Adding a blob shadow. Blob shadows is a cheat. Instead of casting rays of light and checking if it hit anything, it simply um, projects a dark image. In this case, just a circular black blob onto anywhere below any below our character. This is easier than this is quicker and easier for a graphics card to do. So it should well should work well on all ranges of hardware. You need to include a blob shadow pre prefab in the standard assets collection so we should use this rather than create our own. This asset has already been imported and, uh, and added to the project in the blob shadow folder. Open the folder and click the blob shadow project prefab and drag it onto our top level our top layer character object player in a hierarchy panel. So we've got blob shadow up here. Yeah we've got a massive builder in. Oh wow, that's really cool. I'm going to be using some of that. Okay, yeah, we've got, uh, we've got this here. We'll just make sure the torso works perfectly. Yes, we've got blood shadow here too. Okay, we need to add this to player. So we've got blood shadow up here. Um, this should add the projector uh, just below the top level of our player's um, hierarchy view. Okay, next you need to modify the blood shadows projectors position and rotation data so it is directly above our character and uh, I'm pointing directly down at the ground. Select the four split layout. Um, four split layout. Oh, I know. Layout. Screen layout. Four split. Okay. Oh, okay. Select the blood position um, select, set the blob shadow projector rotation degrees to 90, 80 and 0 respectively. So we've got um, the player and his blob shadow. Oh, let's see what we've got. Wire meshes and Okay. He's here. Okay. Okay. Um, that's what you call it. That. Okay. Um, set the blood shadow rotation degrees. So we need to go to blood shadow rotation degrees ninety one eighty. Oops. One eighty and zero. Now I'll use the side and side and top use to move the bit to directly overlaps head. You may want to move it up and down a little until you're happy with the shadow size. So we know that it's nowhere near him at all at the moment. So is this? That's right there. It's moving no wall.
Almost got it. A little bit. I think I should do. I should do it now. One problem is that he's actually his meshes is way too high. He's not touching the floor. So I need to <coughs> bring this a little bit higher. It actually looks like it's on the floor properly. Oh, thanks. Next we got oh sorry I even just notice my headphones not even plugged on. Okay, now we're doing creating a new layer. At this point you would have noticed that a blob is also being projected onto the lips. We don't want this to happen. There's two options to get around this. Move to the near clip settings far away from the projector or simply tell it not to project onto objects in, in, spot, in particular layers. We could use in a later option. Um, why not just adjust the near clip pine? This technique you may seem easy at first glance, but the plane will need to be adjusted by script to take it on into account lips animations. His feet move further out when he jumps, then breathe move a little further than he lands again. Since the shadows have always been projected onto the ground on which lips stands, this means that a near clip player cannot remain the same throughout these sequences. Open the player game object. Just here, so let's make, actually just leave the eyes here. Player game object. Um, open the layer drop down inspector. Make the layer drop down spell. This one. Choose add layer. Click on the first empty layer under user layer. And rename it no shadow. And how do I rename it? Any layer, click on the first empty user layer entry and rename it. This is it, they don't let me rename it. <laughs>
click on the player, game object, right here. Now click back to the play object and now I'll keep pan on to bring up the usual expected settings. Click on the layer drop the list and select the one that says no shadow. Um, you need to ask if you wish to apl apply this to all child objects and uh, game objects. Click change child wait, change child layers let's change that one. Next we need to tell the blob shadow project not to project onto objects in this layer. Bring up the blob shadow project properties in the inspector and look in for the ignore layers entry in the projector component. So we need to go to player blob. Player blob um, ignore layers, which is nothing. So we'll drop down the list and put no shadow. Oh, so now that's a no shadow layer, and it's not going to look at the layers from the no shadow. Okay, that's not. It's, okay. If you are now play the game and move around, you see that the shadow behaving pretty much. Okay, so. If you look at the game and move around, you should now see the shadow behaving pretty much as expected. Um, if you jump over near, except if you jump over around near the collectible field cell. So let's try that. Yeah, that's weird. The light just turned on and off. Ah, oh, supposed to happen, isn't it? See that I am showing the blob shadow too. Oh, the shadow. Yeah, I can see that. The shadow does go onto that. So does everything else. Okay. It's gonna be kind of fun. Can we record that from one of this game? Okay. First up the game, now go to the project panel and locate the fuel cell prehab. So we've got the project panel here. Oops, that wasn't supposed to happen. Okay. Now the project panel. Locate fuel cell prehab. So it's in props. Thank you. Drop a wolf there's the prefab and health pack life pick up prefab, which is this one, so it's just these two. Um set select the root object of each prefab and set it to layers to no shadow. So no shadow. Like the root object. Of, okay, so it's these ones. You find them the profile of our object. And this one. No shadow. Set the root object you perfect. Yeah, make no shadow. I should below. Untie it. 
When make when making a change to a parent object, you need will often article change should be applied to the object's children. Doing so can be dangerous if you haven't thought through all the ramifications. In this case, you want all the charges of the fuel cell prefab and child and health life pickup prefab objects, game objects to be in the same initial layer. So when you need to agree to the proper propagate the changes. Script is concepts. History is is littered with with surprising cons and complex machines known as automata, built by our ancestors for the purpose of entertainment. Some were very um ab um abhorrent and could even perform simple play using puppy puppets. Others were interactive and changed their behavior according to the user input. These machines were fundamental and the same, fundamentally the same. The designer um, created assets, puppets, props, painted backdrops, etc., and then designed machinery to make those assets behave as they desired. The, the, main, the basic principle has remained unchanged over the years. Computers have merely turned it, uh, physical machinery built of steel and springs into virtual machinery controlled by a list of instructions. Uni refers to such list of to such list of instructions or scripts. Most scripts are centered on the concept popular in game development. The fact the finite stage machine. A finite stage machine um, essentially defines a system of interacting conditions known as states. A state can be almost anything, such as whether an object could be rendered at all, whether it is be a subject to the laws of physics, be lit or cast a shadow wherever it can balance its position on the display and so on. The inspector panel lets us change many such states directly because they sta these states are common to almost all games. However, there's, a, there's another type of state which is specific to the game itself. The unit does not know that the player's avatar is an alien, how much damage Lips can take or that Lips has a, jet, has a jetpack. How can you be aware of the robot's guards and required, um, required behavior or how the could interact, um, interact with lips. The, this is where scripts come in. We use scripts to add uh, the interaction and state management um, specified, specific, I can't say it, spec, specific, oh, oh, specific to our game. Our game is, will need to keep track of the number of states. These include the player's health, the number of few cancers the player has collected, whether the player has enough, um, has collected enough fuel to unlock the force field, whether the player has stepped on a jump pad, whether the player has touched a collectible item, whether the player has touched a spaceship, whether the player has touched a respawn point, whether the game over or game start screen should be shown, and more. Many of these states require tests to be made against other object states to ensure they are up to date. Sometimes we even need intermediate states to aid a transition. For example, creating a few cancel will force a check to make sure to see if the player has enough to shut down the force field. Organizing a structure. In this tutorial, the state machine for the player, the level and the enemies are ha handled by a bunch of scripting to various game objects. These scripts talk to each other, um, send each other messages and call each other functions. There are a number of ways we can set up these links, but adding a, a, a link exposed in expector onto which you you drop the relevant object. This is a deal for general purpose scripts which we intend to reuse in other projects. This is the most efficient as a script merely plucks the data from a relevant various and doesn't need to do anything and um, do any of do any searching. However, it does seem you know in advance exactly what object or component you will be linking to. We use this object we use this um, opinion for a subscreen camera in level status. And this script currently just a short second. And this script just is currently a short sub is already attached to the level game object. This gives us the flexibility to set up multiple cameras, one for the level exit unlocked cutscene and other for the level con a level complete sequence. In practice we only use two cameras in the game, one for the player and one for the level complete sequence, the other for the unlocked screen cutscene, but the option is there to change this. Set up a link within the script awake function. The awake function is is called on every script to write before the first update. 
event is fired on the game object it is attached to. So the of the link here allows you to cache, um, cache um, the result for later use or in the update function. Typically you would set up a private variable with a link to another game object or component you need to access within script. If you need to do a game object find um, the well, script call to locate the relevant object is much better to do so once only. Inside awake as game object finds um, as game of find whatever the script is quite slow. This object is more suited for the situation when you don't need the flexibility of the first option, but doesn't want to have to have to perform a convoluted search for the object every game cycle. The, per the solution is therefore to search for the object where the script is woken up. Store the results of the search for use in the update section. For example, the levels. The level status script, which handles level state, caches links to the number of other objects, including the player object. We know these won't change, so we may as well make the computer do this work for us. Setting up a link during the update function, this function is called at least once per game cycle, as it is best to avoid using call function calls here. However, the game object dot find and get component functions can be quite slow. This option is used for those situations where the object you need could change at any time during the gameplay. For example, which of the multiple spawn points in this sort of scene should the player be spawned at? This can really change when the game is running, so we need to handle this accordingly. The problem with this is that it is slow, so it's best to design your game such that you don't need to do this often. Scripts in virtual development environment. Unity is an unused tool is an unusual tool in, in, in that it focuses on is on the virtual assets rather than the links and connections between them. A large Unity project can have dozens of scripts of varying complexity dots around the hierarchy, so the design used for this tutorial used some object oriented technique um, techniques to evaluate this. This, the script which deals with a particular part of the state machine, for example, player animation, should also be the one which keeps track of the relevant state variables. This can make things a little complicated when a script needs to be accessed and state variables stored in another script, which is why some scripts cache some variable located to many assets to the environment in information quicker. This technique also assists um, occasionally results in chains of commands which a function in one script may merely cause a similar function in another script. The handling of the player's death and health is an example of this. As you get more experience in Unity you will find other ways to handle states that may, that may be better suited to your games. The design pattern used in this tool should be no um, consider considered on a one size fits all solution. It should not be considered as a one size fits all solution. If you wish, you can turn our player game object into a prefab containing all the changes so you can reuse it in other projects at a start point. Click on the player folder in the project panel. There. Um, create a new prefab and decide it called uh, it's a piece of the player folder. Give the prefab an appropriate name such as lips prefab. So, new prefab. Lips prefab and drag our player object onto the left prefab to complete this process. So we've got the uh, player object into here and there we go. So now we've got our let's play. Okay, um, death and rebirth. Platform games characters tend to lead risky lives and let's is an expectation, um, expectation. We need to ensure he loses a life if he falls off the level. We also need to make sure he really appears at a safe spot. On the, on the level also record every spawn point so he can continue his quest. Another point, another point is that if Leps can fall off the landscape it's possible that the levels of our, um, residents could do so also. Could do so also so these must also be dealt with accordingly. The best solution for this is to use a box collider to catch anything falling off the level. We need we make it very long and bored so that if the player should try using a jetpack while jumping off, we still catch him. 
with a lips will need something to respawn. We need to create a respawn point first. Um, respawn shortly. We will we will we'll come to a respawn point shortly. First let's build a box collider. Create an empty game object. So game object create empty. We name the new object Fallout Catcher. Add a box collider object to it. So components box collider. Add a Fallout dev script from the component third person props. So we've got scripts. Um, so no. Would it be a component? No, it's not a component. Wait. Oh, sorry. Component and um, third party props. And what do you need? Fallout def. Yep. Use the expected to set the variables as shown in the screenshot below. So let's just go down. Okay. Um, transform is minus 200 minus. 50, 92, 0 for rotation, 300 scale by 300. So now if we go to the fallout catcher, you, can, you will definitely see how big the fallout catcher is. So as you can see right here, I want to move around my system. Wait, let's just change it back to the 2 by 3 so now I can move around ok so now if we click fallout catcher you can see that there is so, uh, fallout catcher right here the end of the game level so as soon as I touch this I still think I could glide further than that personally I need to make this look bigger Let's make it by hmm, 400. Better? No, I think more. Okay, let's make it 600. About 600. Okay, that's fair enough. Okay, um, these are none. Yep, that's perfect. Okay. The script on um, the full at their script. This script is short because it simply um, de delegates all the works to the first person status script. This needs to be attached to the loops, but we don't do it just so just yet. The code to handle the collider script is on the trigger. So if we can actually open it, there we go. The code to handle the collider script is in the on trigger enter, which is here. This function is called by Unity when the box collider is dropped by another game object containing a collider component such as depths on the enemy. There's three tests. There's three tests: one for the player, one for a simple rich body object, and the third test to check if the object has a character control component. The second test looks for any uh, props such as boxes to create form of the level. We don't have such items in this in this level, so you don't you can add one if you would like to experiment. The third test is is used for enemies as they won't have original physics attached. If the player hits a box collider, the code simply calls the fallout death function in the lips third party and uh, third person state script. If another object with a collider object hits an, a game object, we simply destroy it, removing it from the scene. Uh, however, it will fall forever. Otherwise, it will fall forever. In addition, we the um, Unity function reset will ensure any required components are also present. This function is called by Unity automatically when adding the component for the first time. It can also be called in for in the edit in editor by clicking the the clock wheel in the right of the component name in the spectrum, which I've done before, as you you may have seen. So if I just show you guys what I did, if I go let's say payout and I press this and I press reset, it will take put it back to where it was supposed to be. Okay. That's the reset menu command. Okay, the script directive also adds. Which is, one second, just add it back on. Hmm. Um, pull up catch all. Okay, um, the which also adds a script directly to the uni uni is component menu. This is a condensive and saves having to hunt for it inside the project panel. 
useful if you have a complex project with lots of assets. If we try to play the game at this point, you will complain because it doesn't know where to make let's reappear. This is where respawn points come in. Respawn points. When the, when the player dies, we need somewhere safe for him to reappear. In this tutorial, let's reappear one of the three respawn po uh, points where the lapse touches one of these points, it will become active and this is where he respawns if he dies. The respawn point are instances of the respawn prefab objects you find in the project plane um, plot folder. This prefab is a model of a teleport base um, coupled with three coupled with three complete particle systems and spotlights um, and some other odds and ends. Here's the basic structure. Let's go find my, there you are. Here's the basic structure. RS base contains the most the mod itself is short in the base with a glowing blue disc in the center. RS spotlight is a spotlight object which shines a a sub a sub a subtile blue light up from the surface on the of the model give an illusion that the blue texture is glowing. The remaining game objects are, are particle systems. The respawn script attached to the parent respawn prefab objects which is between these particle systems depend on the prefab state. If the respawn point is inactive a small subtile particle effect is shown looking like a blue a bit a bright blue mist. This is contained in RS particle inactive. If the spawn point is active, a large more obsidian effect is shown. This is contained in RS particle active. Only one respawn point can be active on the level at, at any one time. When a player touches the respawn point, a collider object sets as a trigger takes this and triggering activation of the respawn point. The remaining three particular systems, RS particle respawn 1, RT respawn 2 and 3, are enabled together when the player is respawn at the respawn point. There are one shot particle systems, the script lets through these play, then restore the RS particle active um, particle system once this one shot sequence is completed. The prefab contains a script respawn, which controls the state of the respawn point. However, in order for the game to know which specific respawn point the player needs to be returned to when it dies, we need to arrange the respawn points in the hierarchy under the master control script. Let's do that. Let's do this now. Draw the respawn prehab into the scene view. So let's find the uh, prefab. Hmm. No. Yeah, reform prefab. Okay, um, into the scene view, so just take this over here. Right there. Oh, that's cool. That effect is so cool. Come on. Okay, um, position it as shown in the image on the next page. Okay, so it's supposed to be in the middle. Okay, fine. Actually, let's just delete that for now. And move it up there. This so is the lips can be just moved out of shot for clarity, so I'll just move them there. Okay, um we named this instance response. Respawn one, sorry. We name respawn one. Okay, repeat the above set twice. You can place these wherever you like. Add more if you wish. I suggest putting in one near the end area at the far end of the level and over to the trees in the garden above the platforms. So Oh you can go here, yeah, that's cool. Oh that's gonna be really cool. Okay, um let's just stick one up there. On there. And one near the trees and fire on the level, so it's probably down here. So 
stick on right there too. Okay, so this one is two. And this one is number three. Why did I do that too low? Why did I do that? Three. Okay, um, I don't think you can go all the way on here, you know. See the fact? No. It's there, just leave it there. Okay, um, we need these respawn point. No, wait. Next step is to create a, create a, co a container game object. I need this so container. Container? I'm not sure. How do you create a container? Oh, okay, I know what you're talking about now. Um, here. A random uh, empty game object and call it. I don't know. What you're um, it's called empty contain uh, game object and then names game object contain um, respawn point. Oops, not I. Respawn point and make all the respawn. Prefabs inside children of respawn points. So one to three. Put them one side you. So it's our respawn points. We've got one, two, and three. Okay, how it works. When the screen is loaded, you need to cause the start function in each instance of the respawn um, script. Where some useful robots are interlated and and put pointers to other alignments are cached. The key mechanism is centered around the static variable. Static variable current script equals respawn. This defines a global variable named current respawn. The static keyword means it is shared across all instances of the script. This lets us keep track of which respawn point is the current or active one. However, when the scene begins, none of the points are active activated so we need to set a default one for our scene. The unique spectacle will not display static variable types at all so the script defines an entire an entire respawn property which needs to be set for each instance. Drag respawn one onto the entire respawn slot in the inspector. So if we go to one, wait, let's go back to this. Um, wait, um, I did it. Possible to set these properties directly into the original prefab. When a respawn point is activated by player players and colliders, this this that points respawn point scripts first deactivates the old respawn point and sets and then sets current respawn point to this point itself. The set active function takes care of firing off the relevant particle systems or sound effects. The respawning of the character um, player's character is handled by the third person status script. <coughs> which manages most of the player's game state. Add the third player um, status script to the player object. So we've got player, and we need to add the third person. No, third person player, third person status. I 
next is going to be Neil and the scripts. Control attack, animation, push, status. Okay, so we need to add this to the game, the player object, which is right here. Player. So now we, he now has this script. Um, this script can be found in scripts, player, focus, and status. Okay, the respawn point script also handles sound effects. These are played as, as one shot samples except for an audio source attached to each respawn prehab. This component activates an active sound which is a loop. The script simply enables or disables the sound as appropriate whenever you are playing a one shot threat such as when the player is actually respawning or activating the respawn itself or when the respawn has been deactivated. Unity makes it almost too easy to add sound effects. Wherever you plan to add such an asset, Consider carefully how it will be used. For example, we haven't included a spawn deactivated sound because we've never heard the sound being played. You are likely to position two respawn points with a within within a shot of each other. If you were to convert the pro the project into a more clear game, you may want to add such a sound and the necessary script code to handle it. The script is not complex and you should find the script code easy enough to follow. We will return to respawn later in the latest chapters. Okay, next chapter. Setting the scene. With our hero now mobile, our next set is to get him some give him something to do. Quickly, I don't think I don't think the script can work yet. Setting the scene. Um, in this session, we will be looking at building the game world where the action takes place. In movie terminology, this means building the set, place, and the props, and writing the script um, that lets our player interact with them. Our first set is to prepare the stage. The story file already has a basic level mesh set up at our player with a number of collectible items. We will start. We will place a few more props and elements, but most have been done for you as placing all the, these props would make for a very very boring tutorial. Lighting. The level is already provided with an, uh, an 
ambient light as well as merry thin point lights. These lights up these light up the scenery, the player, the enemies and to the limited extent the pickups. In this project case the, the lights were placed by the artists who modeled the vet, the level. Lighting Lighting plays such an important role in creating the ambience and sense of place where it is usually best to leave this to the modeler who built the level. Placing props. The basic set is sorry, just go yeah. the basic set is provided for you, along with a number of props already in place. Building on levels. The two levels built by Region City Increments in Maya and then importing the level into Unity. If you would like to experiment or even create additional levels, the individual scenery can be found in the brilliant folder and the control but there are a large number of so let's quickly why is that gap let's go to the build me build my own folder and just stick some more stuff around so um, we got medium power medium power okay Okay, let's take this off. Oh, I can't. That side. Okay, well, we can always just put this up here. Okay. How did they do their bridge? They put those little lamps in, don't they? Still, isn't it? No. Light posts. Light. I don't know if they were. Hmm. I don't know. But I had something. <laughs> so I don't even need the bridge door, I can just stick. When these objects were here. Um. 
probably just gonna see like because I'm gonna do that for health or something. Or some, someone wants it, I don't know. Just being a little bit more creative, just adding a little bit of level. You know what I mean? Okay. So, um <clears throat> there is a large number of fuel cell props and place and place and all these will make up for a very dark tutorial will need will if you have read the previous tutorial, you already know how to do this anyway, so we will limit the placement to the health pickups. The health, the jump pad and respawn plates among others. Health pickups. We begin with a simple task, adding some collectible health pickups. These are spinning glow hearts that add health to our player. The pickups are already defined as prefabs in the project panel. Look inside the props for and you'll find the health pickups pickup prefab. So let's go projects. Props, sorry. Props, and we'll look prefab right there. Ready to use. Um, drag one into the scene view and use Unity's position to the position where they're on the level. Okay, so I want one here. Repeat this process until you place all, uh, um, about half a dozen of these around. So let's just stick them all over this. So we can stick one here. Coliseum there. Oh, this is cool. Last one, right back here. Okay, um, where you have located, where it's located up to you, though you should be too easy to find or get to, consider how the player might find, might play the level, how the player might play the level and decide where the best places are for such pickups. It is best not to be too generous or the game will be too easy. Finally, we should, um, we should group these pickups into one folder and one folder of some sort to avoid having them clutter up the hierarchy panel. We can do this by creating an empty game object using the game panel. Create empty um, game object. Create empty menu item. Rename it to health pickup. Health pickups. Health pickups, um, and use it in a group. And use the group your health pickups as shown. So we're just gonna put that group order down. Put them inside health pickups. And here we go. Just lock clean on. Okay. Um, the force field. I remember the force field trapped. Trapping our hero especially it doesn't animate, it's just a static mesh texture. The result is um, visualizing disappointment. So if we go to spaceship, force field. And this is the force field. Okay. Um, there's a number of ways to achieve a decent visual effect, but into but which to choose. Sometimes a simple solution is the best. We will just animate the textures, UV conditions to give it an effect on a rip. A rippling force field. The mission animation will be done using a short script which you could be found inside the scripts mesh folder in the project panel it is named 
mesh texture offset. So it's in the M scripts script MS and we're looking for fence. We got a fixed texture offset. It just has a scroll speed, the time, scroll speed, and the T. The first line exposes, um, exposes a, prop, a property we can edit directly into the Unity if, um, interface. Scroll speed. The fixed update function is called a set number of items per second by Unity. We use a short formula. Multiply the scroll speed value up to the current time to define a texture offset. Pretty properties. When you use this better displays properties are variables. Their names are adjusted to make them look nicer. Usually this means this just means looking for a capital letter and a name and setting a space between each one. In addition, it capitalizes the first letter of the name. First scroll speed is displayed as scroll scroll speed. Okay. Um, wait a second. So it's what was it supposed to put it in something? We just want to find it. Yeah, I just find it. Okay, um second do 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 yeah. When the texture is rendered, the texture itself is usually just an image. The main the main texture offset properties of a material tells you need that is to draw the textures offset the image offset you on and within its UV space. This can be used to produce some very um, effective results without resorting to um, complex animation sequences. Expand the level geometry game set to reveal the different elements of the level data. That one is wow we're really good. Um, level data. We need to animate the fence on on the impound fence object. So drag the fence on the script onto the impound fence. And there's the impound fence and there's the fence to the There we go. Scripting and collectible items. Adam Lips does not pick up any item on the level. This is because Uni has not told to let our hero do this. We need to add two elements to each collectible item. A collider component, script code to handle the collider and update place half, etc. The collectible item in the hierarchy panel are all prehab instance instances which are displayed in blue. By adding to an original prehab directly, you can automatically update all the items in the game. The two prehabs are here can collect our fuel so if you have and help pick up the gap. These can be loaded inside the props, which are north, which is right here, is this one and this one. That's the prehab and that's the prehab. Okay, um set the root health prehab. Use component physics add and add a a sphere collider. To add a sphere collider to preamp, this should be appeared in Inspector. Finally, set the is trigger checkbox. There we go. The object rotator script is usually attached to the prehab. This just makes it makes the pickup spin on the spot and it is very simple. We need a more complex example for script and animation in a later episode, in a later chapter. Colliders have two uses. We can hit them with something else or we can use them as triggers. Triggers are invisible components which, as their name applies, triggers an event. In Unity, a trigger is simply a collider with its, its trigger property set. This means when something collides with the trigger, it acts like a virtual switch instead of a physical entity um, entirely. Triggers will send one of the three event messages when something sets them off. On slash trigger enter, on trigger stay or on trigger exit. Trigger events messages are set to any trigger attached to the trigger um, object. So now we need to add a suitable script to our health prehab. Go to the component menu and choose the pickup script from the third person props submenu.
So go to the components and, you, and choose pickups from the third person pick up. Set the pickup property in the spectre to health. Right. So the pickup type to health. I showed the image above. Finally set the amount property to three or so. Three. This is the amount of health the pickup blurs onto the player. How much health? The health? The heads up display or HUD which shows the player's current health le health level, lives, etc. can also handle a maximum health level of six. Which happens if the player coll um, collects a health picker when he already has a health full health bar. This is a matter of taste, but I've chosen to make this trigger additional of an extra life. The, the logic of this can be found in a player's state script, third person status. The few so pickups are set in much the same way. There are only two differences. The pickup type setup should be fuel cell and the marked value sh which is allowed for pickup or fuel the pickup results. Um, the amount value is which is the amount of fuel the item uh, represents which should one seems best so we need to do the same thing for this one it's free yep do we need to add yeah we do we need to add a collider too so no Not that, but we just need the block I don't know. Oh, sorry, it's up here. That's why. Block ladder on. So no, not block. It's not block ladder. We need the physic um the sphere ladder, which is on. And I also need. And that should the pickup should be set to fuel cell. Amount is one. Okay, jump pads. Jump pads are a bright yellow and bright yellow are the bright yellow and black strip places on our level, which I've seen and they look awesome. If I just go over here to the first one. Ah, so quick now. Of course, so it just gets quicker. More hold it. Yeah. This is what I'm talking about. So, the jump pads are the bright yellow and black strip places on level. These are supported to boost leps into the air. We, sh we shall use a collider with the attached script for this purpose. First, create an empty object and call it jump pad trigger triggers. So, create empty. Rename jump had triggers we will use this like a folder to keep our jumper triggers objects together now we build our prehab create a new game object and rename this to jump Patrick one so jump had trigger one Jump at trigger one, add a blocks collider to it. A sphere won't work in theory, but the box collider is a better fit given the jump basis shape here. Yeah. Set the collider as a trigger. Add a jump pad script. Um, then that's the object. That's the ob. One second. That's the object. That's the object created. Now we need to turn it into a prehab. Choose prehab from the create menu above the project panel. New prehab. And what we're we gonna name it? 
We need to hear a jump trigger. Dragon dot jump pad game object on the front. We need to we need to prehab to jump at your goal. I think that goes in there then and that one goes in there. Jump head trigger, drag the jump head into the scene and I have to get a feel. I'm just have to delete this in fact. Make a new one. Jump head trigger. that one in here and then delete this one and now okay jump try to jump into scene and position to really unsighted or the jump pad locations there are six players I recommend using the full split you to not position it okay so let's go full split you know full split is incredibly weird Okay. Position right really inside one of the jump locations now six players are in the The default jump pad jump height since of five. is enough to throw them around to the gun level. I suggest using a variable around 15 to 30. So let's just do 17. The finished project um, example uses a value of 30. Let's just throw it Um Okay, so now, now I have to turn this around. I don't know, is this supposed to just work like that, or do I have to actually stretch it all the way around? Whoa. Oh, gosh. That was way too high. Yeah, I see how it works though. Um. too high. Well, first thing, this one is way too high. The rest is okay. This one, let's leave it as 15.
to the way you say it. No, okay. No, what? No. Okay, um, you know that one works, but now we need to make another one, one, should you just leave all the hat trigger, it doesn't make a difference really. It's like some far distances. And uh, no, that was gonna have to be something like 15. <laughs> Fifteen is perfect. Why did the other guy do thirty? I don't understand why it's not high. There's just no need for it. Right, let's see we have a thirty. Right, what's the point?
No, that was fine. So now I just need to get, make a lot, a couple more. Um, open triggers. Definitely one down here. Any one down here? I don't know. Make sure that's all of them done. I think that's all of them. They got all three of them gone. So, take it as me, don't miss this as we just done this. You get launched up all the way up here. You know, get to the side, and you're on like the top tree level, but where you keep going and uh, do things and get more things, and then once you're done. You get to here and you take your spaceship home. Your spaceship. Okay. Um scripts works in this pre I was just a link to the pickup script in there. Um, okay, the GUI, or halfway through the book, I think that's enough for today, we're going to do the rest of the whole PFR tomorrow. I still have quite a lot of time, a lot of stuff to do in fact, yeah, we are about to start the GUI, so we want to bookmark this page.
looks like there will be no arms tomorrow. And then tomorrow we're going to carry on and we're going to see if we can finish it. So everyone, I thank you for watching. I hope you guys, if you stuck through the whole episode, I thank you for watching. Um, we've got really, really fun now. As you can see, we've got a technically a fully working game right now. A fully working platformer that you can run around. We've got a working jetpack. Jumps working. The, the cameras are working. So you can bring it back if you want to hold the right click. Or you can use it to redirect them out to the front. You've got the pick up, picking up items, you got the health working. This will do the GUI and things like that. So yeah. Thank you for watching and I'll see you guys next time. It's Izzy Walker and make sure you like, comment and subscribe. Thanks everyone.